Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, thank you, Pavel, for this introduction. I must say I did not understand so much, but I think it was surely polite in the introduction. And I want to give you some impressions on the archaeology of Switzerland. You can already go to it. And the title was on mountains and lakes. This is what Switzerland is uh, characterized for. It's not only chocolate bags and watches, but we have also a lot of archaeology. And I will give you at least two case studies of this archaeology. As Pavel probably already told, this lecture is in the framework of the so-called SCOPES project from the Swiss National Science Foundation. And we have a cooperation between four countries, uh, Ukraine, Macedonia, Russia, and Switzerland. And we had already one big event last year. We will have a next event in, 2000, in May 2016 in Macedonia and a final conference again here in Kiev. So, next one, please. You know, Switzerland next one already, is a very small country, 8 million people, and the archaeology of Switzerland has started, as in many cases before, in Switzerland, in, uh, in the 19th century. Pardon. Next, please. And, as I told, Switzerland is a country which is deep, uh, many mountains, it's an alpine country and so this time I will also say something about the archaeology in the Alps and not only the lakes next week. and of course many lakes and on the foothills of these Alps and it was near the lakes mainly when archaeology started in the 19th century. Next week. I will divide my lecture in three parts, so a short introduction, what is, uh, how it all started, how is uh, archaeology of the lakes and of the mountains, then I will give uh, in some in indications on our excavations in the country of Bern. It would be too large to say something about all these more than 1,000 settlements around the Alps, which have been declared UNESCO World Heritage in 2011 and then I will give you some uh, information on a special site which is uh, on nearly 3,000 meters in the Bernese Alps. So, in the 19th century, as in many countries, archaeology started from the bourgeois part of the societies, so the people who, for example, the man with the head was the director of the historical museum in Bern. He was excavated at the Lake of Biel during a lowering, and nowadays this part is already again underwater. In 1854, the settlements around the Lake of Zurich that was the first that had been detected. Next, please. And in 1854, there was already the first archaeological dive I think worldwide in Switzerland, in the Lake of Geneva, you see here some Bernese and uh, uh, Lake Geneva scientists trying to do a uh, preservation of first finds on the floor of the Lake of Geneva. 1854 is this time when this all started, and more or less we can say it was the first time that archaeology was talking about settlements. Before, mainly grave mounds and grave archaeology was the main topic in archaeology and with the discovery of settlements in the lakes, settlement archaeology started. So from 1854, this famous view of archaeological sites in the water, on platforms, uh, was populated and in the second half of the 19th century, these pile dwelling sites got something like an identification mythos of Switzerland. Switzerland was joining as a country, as a, a nation in 1848, and so just several years after the nation building of this um, Swiss nation, as we have today, work upcoming archaeological sites in French-speaking western part and German-speaking eastern part of the country. So the pile dwellings served more or less as a unifying and identifying topic for this young state. Of course, we know today this image of the village is wrong. It was strongly influenced by ethnographers from the South Sea, from uh, Papua New Guinea indeed. Next, please. 
Nevertheless, the theme of the Paldwells Pal is still very vivid in the population. Every child knows about them, and in 2007 we had this soap opera, I call it. It was a sort of TV show going 12 weeks every day in the TV. They accompanied several families that were living like in the Stone Age, and the TV was what I think several million people were worth watching this TV soap opera and looking on the fate of these people. So it's still a very strong topic in the population. Nowadays, this archaeology is depending on two pillars. One, we have a lot of large-scale rescue excavations. Even, for example, this picture on the right side is in the city of Zurich before the Opera House. Below the Opera House are extensive layers of archaeological sites from the Neolithic, or we have underwater archaeology in the lakes where erosion is a problem for most of the settlements and so also rescue archaeology is in the lakes a thing. Next please. Another topic in Swiss archaeology, but I will not talk in detail about this, was the discovery of the Latin site which gives the whole culture of Latin in Europe its name. It was found also by searching for a pal valley and all in all, on this place of Latin, there have been found 170 swords, lance heads, next please, and many wooden parts. So this was also an exceptional find spot, which was long time also thought to be a Pal Valley, but we know today it's an Iron Age cult place, and it has nothing to do with um, the Pal dwelling sites, next please. But this uh, Latin site since it gave the name to a whole European culture, it is also one of the big topics of Swiss archaeology. Next, please. When I was talking already before, I will give you more indication of very new research, which has just started in 2003 and was, has come to an end this year or last year because we published it in two volumes. It's an archaeology that is related to global climate change and retreating glaciers. Next, please. So we come to the second one. Next, please. So pile dwellings, as you see here on these maps, are like a collier around the Alps. We have here Switzerland between the Lake of Geneva here in the southeast and the Lake of Constance. And around the Alps there are more than 1,000 sites from the Neolithic and the Bronze Age. The most dense, highest density is between Lake of Geneva and Lake of Constance and in this area that we call Three Lakes area in Switzerland where we have alone about 200 places in these three lakes. That does not mean that it's one place is one village, this can be the case, but for example some places have up to 25 settlement layers on one on the other, so these 1,000 sites are uh, perhaps three to five thousand settlement faces from the Neolithic and the Bronze Age. Next, please. This is the main information, the chronology. It starts in northern Italy around 5,300 BC, and the most sites are between 4,300 and 800. We have settlement archaeology and Neolithic Bronze Age, very few from the early Iron Age. And of course, these are the earliest agrarian societies, all our peasants. And we have early metallurgy from copper bronze and to iron. We go now in this direction, in the center of this lake, this small lake of the Free Ones, Lake of Beer. And this is the diving basis we could inaugurate in 2010. It works now nearly six years. It's like a modern pile dwelling for the diving archaeology of this lake. We had the last, I was, I'm not working anymore for this project, I changed to the university in 2011, but we have been working nearly 20 years with a full team of divers, for six persons regularly diving the whole year. Next please. The installation of, of this diving base is a, a movable, movable platform and always two divers in the water. The depth of diving is not really deep. Sports divers would uh, find it ridiculous. It's most time between 60 centimeters and 2 meters of water depth. 
but it's very practical to walk underwater with professional diving. Next. Underwater, we installed always a grid of 10 meters large in this direction and up to 80 meters long. And so two divers could work on defined areas. We use water pumps that produce artificial streaming, so no pumping, but streaming of water. And this makes that you have always clear visibility. Next. And as on the excavation on land, drawing and documentation is of course important. You see here two divers at work and they use plexiplates plexi plexi of one to one meter. You can uh, draw the structure on this plexiglass plate and two divers are diving auto autonomous with surface supplied so dives can go up to three hours. And of course it's diving in the winter months so it's dry suit diving and the team usually dives nine to uh, ten months in the year. Very important in this whole project is dendrochronology. I suppose most of you are archaeologists and know what is dendrochronology. This is John Frankes. I worked with him over many years. He was one of the inventors of this um, method. And then another name is tree ring uh, dating, Next, please. which works by overlapping tree rings from today till now days 8480 BC. It's not really good visible, but we, in Switzerland and southern Germany we have a tree ring calendar that goes back more or less the last 10,000 years. So it's rather sufficient to date the sites at Lake of Me that go back to around 4000 BC. Next please. So all the datings that I give in the next slides are actual year precise datings. We don't use radiocarbon because dendrochronology is much more precise than radiocarbon. Radiocarbon has a dating span of about 100 to 300 years in best or worst case, whereas dendrochronology is clear by one year. You can just say it's precise by one year. So in this slide you cannot see so much, but it's not better show show like we'll go in details afterwards. It's a three kilometer strip of the Lake of Biel. Our office was or is here, the diving base is also here and we have been excavating here in this area and here in this area about uh, 50,000 square meters underwater and within this project more than 40,000 40, pile samples have been um, taken and on these pile samples the whole chronology Re relies. It starts with an early, early settlement or structure around before 4000, but most of the structures are dating 3800 to 2600, and some are from the early Bronze Age. I will show you some village plans from this area. You can already see here are houses, here are houses, here is a village, here is a village, and all so on. All in all, it's about 25 villages during the time, and we will start only, not all is 25, this would be, take too long, but I will give you some indications from this area and from this area, and show you some examples from villages that have been excavated more or less completely. Next, please. In, we started in 1988 with this village here, so you have always the excavation date, and below are the dates of the settlement. One of these settlements, we will have a closer look, is about here. You see two rows here and a third row here, related to pathways. Next, please. And this is the uh, view of this settlement. It starts around 3580. 281, and then we have a progression of these settlements. We have all in all 25 buildings uh, excavated, but this is not the whole excavation because all this part here was not excavated, and only one building here was detected. So, probably a third row of buildings, and this part of the settlement was not excavated, it's still in the lake to be excavated later, but it's protected by some protection measurements. So for, this is very typical. We can follow the history of this settlement during the years from 3000, 
3,567. It's also very typical that we have uh, rows of buildings, large buildings that have probably living function, and these small houses here that have been probably for storage or for um, not probably animals, but let's say working places or small houses. We don't think that these houses have been inhabited. For example, there are no grinding stones, such things in this park. So this is the main part of the village and we see they always start from the inner part and then grow within years to the outside. Next, please. So this village could have seen like this. In color are the houses that have been um, excavated and the other that are extrapolated. And this is the situation 3574 with a rather huge um, windbreaker or palisade, double palisade filled with probably material. And when the village was build, going on, they were still building outside of this fence. Next, please. When we go back, we were now looking to a slightly younger village, which is here, so called Riedstation. It was also completely excavated. Next, please. And we have here the case that two buildings here in this part, they have been built 3,412. But obviously these two houses were never inhabited then because they were, were never repaired and we have no sign that somebody lived here really. But we think it was just the first step of building a village and it, it was abandoned, it was not uh, going on. But 200 meters far away, so this is uh, just a real distance, 20 years later was built up a new village. It started in 3393 and it was built during five years. Next please. It's now going automatic. And we can follow by the chronology each construction phase of this village. So during five years the people of this settlement were building houses starting within a core here in this place then the next came over there and within uh, five years we have the construction of the whole village. It is very astonishing that there are only repairs of this village for one year more and we think after six years the village was already given up. Next please. Some colleagues of us have found in the, very close to this settlement in another lake this, uh, the settlement of Morton Panchau, which looks more or less the same. We have also a row of big houses, um, pathways and small houses. And here we have the same structure. The village was built during some years, starting in 3428 and ending in 3425, so during four years. And the whole village lasted about 12 years. Next please. We can compare now these two settlements and we see Moten Pacha, 3430 to 3450. It was constructed during four years, had a lifetime of 12 to 15 years, whereas Sutzlatrik in Rittstation was constructed during five years, had a lifetime of only six years and ended already 3389. So this means it's not really economic to build a village during five years and give it up in the six years. We think climatic change has um, led to a rising of the sea level in this time and also the change of water courses produced environmental changes and the village had to give up not by uh, free will but by environmental conditions. So this is the overview again of this site. We have been here and here. Now we change to this area here. This is just under research, where we know that there are very dense big villages. Like also there is a complete change in the village construction. The villages are getting much larger and we have in this area at least three villages overlapping themselves and this will be the research work for the next years to find out which are the really the village plans here because we have just done here some research and these others are more or less 
extrapolations from the first ideas we have, but it's not really published. Next, please. When we go further to the eastern part of this settlement area, we will have a closer look to these settlements here. These are from the final of the Neolithic, from about the Cold Ware phase, where in Western Switzerland just the last um, signs of Cold Ware arrive. There's no more settlements of the Cold Ware type after the three lake regions in this piece. And again, these settlements look different. They are not to compare with the other ones. We have now settlements that are like perpendicular to the to the um, beach here with one row and houses just left and right of this one row. You see some buildings here on this uh, first slide and also a um, recent work in research, but we can detect every house and we see how the houses are built. Here it would go in details, we see here repair phases, so the house was built, but obviously they did not like the construction, so two years later they restructured some more walls, all the yellow parts are the younger ones, and we will find out in the next uh, years or months so hopefully how the whole settlement was built up. I will show you also some finds. We can now go like a DIA show in ceramics, of course, we have a lot. But many thing, objects from these palmarines are of organic material. I will concentrate on this. For example, wooden bowls that are perfectly shaped and um, this underlines the good quality of conservation of these sites. For example, uh, how did it, uh, I don't know the English word, it's um, made Basket. of baskets, yes, thank you, baskets from this time, this space. but also recipients of textiles or basket-like style um, artifacts. Yes. Then, of course, flintstone, this is a typical material coming from uh, France from the French basin, and this is about 500 kilometers, especially in the college rare times they have been traded off, obviously. And of course, many objects from Anglo and deer bones, this is very typical. And in a certain period, we had these necklaces of stone, this was the a uh, model in around 2750 around, many of these stone patterns, but also teeth of uh, foxes, wolves, dogs, and in sometimes even the finger um, bones of dogs have been worn on clothes. And of course, beer. So, teeth is <coughs> perforated teeth is one of these very typical objects for necklaces, or perhaps it was not just for beauty, it was for defending against illness or uh, to prevent from sickness or something like this or accidents. Then, of course, many composite, um, composite objects like these ribs taken together to build a cup. Again, some necklace, some more tools of stone and these big um, antler in, um, intermediate pieces. And here you see how it works. This is the shaft complete and this would go just here inside. So it's made for very, uh, not cutting trees, but for small work on um, carving, wood carving, something like this. And of course, many deer axes, most of them have still the remain of the wooden shaft inside. Fisher nets, which prove also, of course, fishing was one of these things. So this is a, all in all, it's a complete fisher net from about 1 meter to 50 centimeters, but found in parts, of course. And also, I like these objects very much. This must be something like comes. And then you have here you know, three different parts. You have birch bark, then these small wooden parts, and birch tar that keep them together. And I think it's really incredible that archaeological objects of this fragility survive and can be found. Of course, we don't have dozens of them, but we have some 
some of these camps in the settlements found. Of course, the uh, hammer axis, and this hammer axis is also with the original shaft inside. So we have in Switzerland one very famous object with the shaft of more than one meter long. This illustrates a bit the shafts are very thin compared to the heavy axe, and we suppose this cannot be tools for working, but it should be something like signs for power or um, of uh, strong or hero people, persons, something like this, because the, the work to produce such an axe is incredibly high to polish it, and you cannot really use it to our kingdom. Also very nice objects that uh, I have not seen so much are uh, arrow projectiles where you have the wooden shaft, the bone, the bone uh, point and then also these birch tar mass and you see here the remains of the fixation which has been gone meanwhile perhaps it was a sinew from animals which is not conserved. To all these Settlements of the pile dwellings exists meanwhile a database from all six countries and this database can be um, used for research if there are two options, one is a public option and one is a researcher option so if you are a researcher you just have to apply for a access pin and then you can go in details and you get from each of these nearly 1000 sites uh, the whole information and also, meanwhile, has, or for the inscription as the UNESCO World Heritage, we have set up an iPhone and smartphone application which is in four languages and it's free to download. So this application was one of the uh, promoting tools for this UNESCO World Heritage. And meanwhile, also museums are in the, in the app. So you get the complete information if you travel around and it's a uh, GIS based so you always see where is the site I want to go and where I am. This is this famous small point in the uh, GPS device of the smartphones. And when you are on the place, you when you are on the right place, you can listen a three minute um, introduction to the site. And we think it's much better than reading large uh, plates to see, to just hear what is said and I think you can also try it out, it's free on the, on the internet, you can always download it, it's free, it just takes uh, some uh, volume of your uh, storage volume. So, we change now completely to another environment and we go to this site of Lake Schneeleo in the Bernese Alps. This site is we have been here on the Lake of Biel and these dots and crosses are ice finds in the Alps. Of course the most famous ice site is here number three in red because the red ones are prehistoric ones. It's the so-called Ötzi from the border between Austria and Switzerland, a frozen corpse from around 3400. More or less, it's the same time as the village I have shown that is uh, developed in during five years, not in Richtation. This is contemporary. There are other sites. One site is uh, on um, late iron clothing from the glacier, and two sites, Schneideo and Mötchenpass, are in the Bernese Alps. All other finds here are either historic glacier mummies, like number five. Uh, six and uh, seven, or the others, for example, these ones here are historic ice finds from the First World War, when the war was in the Alps, uh, between uh, Austria-Hungary again Italy, and some are also plains. For example, here is the plain on the Gauli Gletscher, it's an American plain that uh, was going down 1946, and this is a German plane from also from the 1940s that have been trapped by glaciers. We will not look at this, we will just look on this side, um, Lake Schneeleo, which is just on the border between the cantons of Wallis and Bern, and below is the valley of the River Rhone that goes to the Mediterranean. This site was discovered in 2003 
in this very hot summer where when glaciers retreated extraordinarily and this retreating of the glaciers was also in 2004 and 2005. And the origin two hikers were going across this pass here, which is this is the pass, and this pass is about 2,750 meters high, whereas the the Wildhorn here is nearly 3,300 meters. It's um, now covered by glaciers going down this way and going down this way, but during times in the Holocene, also this area was glacial. But it is on the top of the glacier, and so not much movement occurs, and you can more or less imagine it's like a frozen lake. The finds stem all from this area on the north side, and now it's rather sunny, but it's uh, always shaped by this wall that is going up here. Next, please. So, contrary to the site of the Ötzi, where we have one event, one person that has been dying, in Schniedeau case, it looks like that the first objects have been lost about 4,800, 4,500 BC. This is a uh, cup. And so it's 1,500 years older than the Ötzi site. And then the whole time goes through till the Middle Ages in the year uh, 1000. Then comes a gap and the uh, next finds are modern um, tins and ski equipment from the 1950 on. So it's more or less 6,000 years of history in this place. This is a view from, from the top. The, the way is going by here, and you see this is the remaining ice field that is still there. Since, since, since um, 2006, the ice field is not free anymore. We did not find more finds on the ice field uh, directly, just in the surroundings of the ice field, and it's still covered by ice, uh, by snow pump. And only a very hot summer will bring to smell to melt again these times. You see the area is rather bare, no trees, no um, just rocks. It's a very uncomfortable place. Even in summer you can have frozen days when people swim in the lakes you, you just freeze on the top. The next place. And also in summer sometimes there is snow. You see here some persons. This is the area where the finds were found. This is this top of the of this past. We were also always working in small teams. In the first two years, we even kept it secret. We did not say to anybody something. And we had a local measurement system by GPS on, on this place. We did not work with helicopters. We just walked up. It was only once in a helicopter transport. Next, please. So often it was just searching by ice on the surface of this ice field here, but also on the margins of this ice field, we found many objects. All in all, next please, we have found nearly 900 objects. I was still a bit younger, and uh, this is, was one of the core teams, so three persons. It was sufficient to collect these 900 items. You see, we were packed with boxes, stuff in the rucksacks, and it was carried down, and usually we were leaving on the side at 4 o'clock. That means we were by the car at about 7, 8 o'clock. Then we phoned to the restoration office, and they waited at 10 o'clock in the office. We brought in the material at 10 o'clock, and they worked the whole night to make a first preparation of the, of the objects. This is a very typical working situation. And um, you have some melting water, some ice here, and then the rocks. And you see perhaps the archaeological item. Who oh, sees it? Here. Next, please. So these are the radium carbonates of the Neolithic objects, which start more or less around 4,800, 4,300, with the first group of objects. You see the, it's, it's uh, published and you see here is the code for the origin of the material and some items are given on this slide. So here for example it's a 
wooden bowl that is rather old, the oldest wooden bowl in Switzerland. Then comes another group which is more or less of the same age. And this could be seen as if this was the highest frequency of the past, but it was not like this. These were many objects where we think they are for one person. So it's more as a complete bow equipment. For example, here shoes, part of the trousers, a bow case, a bow, and many arrows. And we don't think somebody loses this material in the, in the Alps, but we have the idea it has been coming from one person in space. So these are the radial carbonates from the Bronze Age because there's a rather big gap between the latest date of the Bronze Age. Oh, no, pardon. There's no gap, but it's going on 2000 till about 1600 BC for the early Bronze Age. Also many objects of, of leather, then here something leather, but also wood and such datable items. Next please. And there's a short group of early Bronze, uh, early medieval to the medieval round 1000 BC, uh, AD. Then comes probably the so-called uh, small ice age with um, glaciers that start moving forward from around 1300 on till 1850, 1900, and this time the pass was sure they blocked. Next please. So objects that have been found is near the ice, so part of a wooden recipient. It's also extraordinary to have recipients in the Alps. Next please. And this recipient was, this is another picture of it. It was a bottom soon parts, many decoration parts here, and some wooden parts. Obviously it was a big size um, recipient to store something we don't know what. Next please. Also very important is this leather trouser. It's nearly one meter long here. And it was just one legging of, uh, so half of a, Trouser, you have also sewings here, repair marks of this trouser, and this is the, exactly the same thing as Ötzi was carrying. We could make an uh, ancient uh, DNA analysis of this leather, and it is clearly it was goat leather from a domesticated goat. We can even trace the origin of the goat. Uh, that it goes back to Greece and Azerbaijan, so no Swiss relatives of this goat, but uh, it was an extermin race. Also, shoes of the Neolithic, this date also around 2800 BC. I don't think they look like shoes, but the shoe specialists say these are typical shoes from the Neolithic, so we also believe it. Next, please. And also, Roman shoes, all in all about five uh, to six shoes from this place. Next, please. And for me the most impressioning object is what you have already seen on this earlier picture. I've, we think today it's a bow quiver, so a bow case, not for just arrows, but to carry a bow. Next, please. It's made of birch bark and it's all in all one meter sixty long. It has a and lower part, and here this is the sort of cap to put it on the top and to um, close this box. It's here's a reconstruction of this um, of this box case, and you see here find pictures how it was found. It was found in three pieces. So this item here is this item here. Then the middle part is this one, and the upper part was found by the hikers. This was the first object that said was found. It's exactly of the size of the bow we found there, and on this picture here you can see it, but there was a cord lying around, and we think it's the cord of the bow. It's typically um, a sinew for bow for bows. Also, to this bow equipment, many arrows have been found, around a dozen of arrows. This is a typical fine situation near the ice. They were just melting out from the ice. And this is the collection of the fully restored arrows. So 
Uh, meanwhile, I think we have a bit more, the, but all in all, that must have been more than a dozen arrows. Some are also, also only partially conserved. We have only one end or middle parts, but we have still more uh, than, uh, than 20 parts of bows that are not, could not to take it together. Also, one exceptional find is the bow. It's one meter sixty long, and this bow is absolutely perfect um, uh, conserved. It was in the ice. It's uh, so good conserved that it needed, needed no further conservation treatment. So we have a bow that is not conserved. It just as it came out from the ice dried, and we can do further chemical in the lab analysis on this bow. You see here the tips of this bow and it's made of if uh, what uh, taxus in the Latin name. So a typical bow wood as many bows in Europe. You see here the drawing. So we were very happy. At least we have a complete bow equipment consisting of a bow, the sinew, the box for to put the bow in and for arrows. This is the, nearly the last, one of the last slides. We will go to the situation of this path. More access to this path is regulated by glaciers. For example, this is an image from around 1900, and you see the, the way today goes up here, moves around here, and here in this area, this is blocked by an advancing glacier. Today the situation looks completely different. We have a strong retreating of the glacier. Yes, please. You see the same situation here. This moraine, or this moraine here, and the glacier has been opening here, and you go, can go very easily to the top of the pass. When you have a situation like this, it's nearly impossible to cross because you have very deep crevasses. It's very, very um, dangerous and it's only for experienced mountaineers to traverse whereas for example people with animals or herders they would absolutely not go through Next, please. so we all in all we found different images from this place from old pictures it's a bit small but you see here this is the place where the glacier is advancing and you see it looks today completely different and this is a a view of the glacier, there are some persons here, and today it's completely free of ice. So this situation, free of ice, must have been occurred several times during the Holocene, and then you had easy access over this pass, whereas when the glaciers were have been advancing and progressing, we we don't think that people could move over this path. So this is an early example for how climate change during the Holocene related to human, humans and human economy. All in all, we, our research from Schnitte and red data have now more and more found uh, to science articles on climate change, and you know part of the University of Bern, one of their main pillars is research on climate change with the Oeschke Center of Climate Change Research and the research group uh, from uh, Samuel Nussbaumer took this data and you see more or less that when glaciers are retreating we have archaeological finds on the GDL and when the glaciers are advancing there are no more finds on the on this Pass. To go more in details on this site, for example, one group of the Oeschke Centrum biologists were, have been drilling in a small lake just about one hour of way below the pass. It's a Ifixe on an altitude of around 1,800 meters above sea level, and they took it 50 meters water depth. They took a core of about 12 meters long, which covers the whole Holocene by laminating sediments. What is interesting for us, we have here in these um, bands are dates from Schneideo, and it's perhaps too small, but there's a whole group of cultural plants, the upcoming, and they indicate more or less that with the first archaeological finds around 4,000 
800, 4,500, we probably have early pasture so that people were coming to this lake with animals, for example, sheep and goats, to use the high alpine pastures in this early time. This, if this would be, or if this is not the only case as it is now, this would be really rather sensational because up to now, first alpine pastures are seen perhaps in the Bronze Age, or not, but not earlier. This would date back this economy for nearly 2,000 years. Next, please. And so this is the situation in a sort of a model. We think the pass was not used on a long to a long trade pass or a long distance pass, but just people from the south side of the pass, where we have a strong Neolithic occupation, used several ways to use pastures either here or here on this lake by crossing the Schneeo. It's very typical, it's very typical for the Alps that Farmers from the south side cross on the north side of the passes. It's even today, it's, uh, in the valleys, many uh, farmers have still meadows and alps in the north side of the main ridge. And also, for example, in the Ölstal, we have this situation that people from the south are going to the north. And so this is not completely excluded. There's also a big difference, for example, the Valley on the south side here, Sion, the, the city and this area with a lot of Neolithic occupation, it has about 500 millimeters rain per year, so very few <coughs> rain. It's very dry, very warm area, whereas, for example, these areas here on the north side have 2,500, 2,800 millimeters of rain, so it rains all the time and it's probably too wet for wheat and um, such things and even today this region was only getting wealthy when they invented cheese and this was only done in the 16th, 17th century and uh, before there it was a rather poor mixed economy. So this is the perhaps use of this past. The main interest we suppose was the lake and its environment and the natural, natural grasses around this lake. I would like to do some advertising. We have uh, from the Scopes project also together here with the Kiev University a session in uh, Lithuania that is in, in September organized by co different colleagues and this uh, is also organized from the Nidava network. So if you have something to uh, interesting about wetland science you are welcome to apply for a, for a conference there. Next, please. And also, I will do some advertising for Bern in 2019, so this is still far away, but we will have the honor to host the European Association of Archaeologists. In, so perhaps we will all see you there, and you can admire the Bern Mountains from the city, and thank you very much for your attention.